This special episode of Girls on Film comes to you from a live panel at International Film Festival Rotterdam 2023. Here's producer Christine Vachon. As somebody who wants to, you know, stay relevant and keep making films, I'm always looking to see, like, how do we, how do we use disruption for opportunity? I think that's why we've stayed in business so long. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. I'm going to get that gun of mine, and I'm going to change you from a rooster to a hen with one shot. Some people call me a freak. I hate that word. I don't believe in it. Better yet, I don't believe in labels. You know, I think you're the only girl in the world that can stand on a stage with a spotlight in her eye and still see a diamond inside a man's pocket. Because I'm up at five every morning working my ass off. Does someone want to just tell me to my face, you're never going to give me the scores I deserve? Hello, I'm Anna Smith. This special episode of Girls on Film was recorded with a live audience at the International Film Festival Rotterdam on the 27th of January 2023. My guests were powerhouse producer Christine Vachon, whose many films include Zola, directed by Janiska Bravo, about two strippers on a crazy road trip. I also speak to Dutch critic Dana Linson and to Nafis Nia, who wrote and directed That Afternoon, a drama that follows refugees Roya and Nassim as they talk to each other through a locked door in an apartment block in the Dutch city. Finally, I spoke to director Carolina Lingabe, the director of the new thriller Superposition, along with the film's star, Marie Bach Hansen. Enjoy. Welcome to Girls on Film at IFFR. I'm Anna Smith. I'm so thrilled to have you all here. Thank you so much for joining us at this sold out event, the first talk, I believe. Um, So I'm Anna Smith. I host the Girls on Film podcast. It is so great to be back. This is our third time at the festival, but obviously we've had a bit of a break. So it's lovely for everyone to be back here in person today. Uh, So Girls on Film is a female focused film podcast. Do we have any listeners in the audience, perchance? Give us a shout, because they can't hear you. This is being recorded, so a clap is great. Thank you. So we launched Girls on Film four and a half years ago to spotlight female film critics and female filmmakers, and also to encourage young film critics. Do we have any in the audience? Because I'm doing a talk tomorrow. Is anyone coming tomorrow? Yes, give us a shout. Hooray, at least one. Okay, I'm talking to you tomorrow. I look forward to that. We've had some amazing guests come on as well. We've had um, recently Jamie Lee Curtis, Lashana Lynch, Linda Hamilton, Kerry Mulligan, Andrea Riseborough, who was recently nominated for an Oscar. We also had Vanya from this festival who came on to talk about this incredible festival. But Andrea, does anyone else hear about that? Andrea Riseborough had a surprise Oscar nomination. Um, So we're really proud that we've been there, you know, since sort of early in her career. We've had the nominations for the BAFTAs recently. Oscar nominations, a bit disappointing on the female director front, to put it mildly. So I'm really happy to say that we're going to have our second Girls on Film Awards soon. So we look at things a little bit differently. And this year, The Woman King and The Wonder are leading the nominations. So we're so glad to be rewarding films that have actually been overlooked by the Oscars. Our categories are a little bit different. We have categories like Best Female Friendship, Best Ensemble Acting, Male Ally, because men are very important in this fight as well. And we've added some new categories this year. We've got Best Composer, Best Cinematographer, and we have a very unusual category called Best Female Orgasm on Screen. (laughs) So this always makes people laugh, but it does have a serious intention, right? So our idea is to reward responsible and authentic depictions of female pleasure on screen. And we've had a number of great nominees this year, but one of them, if you have seen it, you will understand why we nominated. So we've got two clips from this. Um, And the first clip um, demonstrates some of the complexities about female pleasure. So let's have a clip from Good Luck to You, Leo Grant. So I've made a list of things that I'd like to get through. Oh, that sounds sexy. (laughs) Don't mock me, I'm a teacher. Old habits die hard. What's first on the list? Number one, uh, I perform oral sex on you. Number two, you perform oral sex on me. Number three, we do a 69, if that's what it's still called. I don't know. Um, Four, me on top. Five, doggy style. That all sounds very achievable. Oh, does it? Oh, good. 
Good, because I'm, I, I have no frame of reference. I've tried um, looking on the internet, but it's alarming, frankly. I mean, if you type in classy porn to Google, up pop 12 windows of erections. I mean, there's no build-up at all. Have I booked enough time? You, you want to do it all today? Yes, if possible. <laughs> <laughs> so, along alongside Emma Thompson in this category, we've also nominated her co-star, Daryl McCormack, as you see from that and from the next clip, that actually, you know, the partner in the scene, when there is one, sometimes it's a solo scene, the partner is, is quite important. Let's have another look at the final clip from Good Luck to You, You don't have to worry, Nancy. This is just about us tonight. So what is your fantasy? Um, I'm not sure you could really class it as a fantasy as such. It's a bit mundane for that. Okay, well, what would you most desire? I mean, desires are never mundane. Um, to have sex tonight um, with you. That's about it, really, for the moment. There you go. Well, we've got some wonderful guests for you today. And the first one is a regular on our podcast, When We Come to Rotterdam, and it is Dana Linson. Please welcome Dana Linson. Round of applause. <laughs> welcome back to Girls on Film. Thank you so much. I can't imagine this is only the third time. It felt like we've been doing this... You're, you're such a natural. As soon as we met you, years. you were like part of Girls on Film. You're like part of our furniture. So well, thank you for thank coming you. back. Thank you. I'm a great chair. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, um, you're a film critic, a steam film critic in Holland. Could you talk a little bit more about what you're up to at the moment for the audience? Wow, at the moment, a lot. I saw that there were some of the young critics uh, of IFFR's uh, trainee program here. Together with my colleague Jan Peter Ecker, we already did a lot of work before the festival. So we did a bit of a tiger hack. So there is a one off edition of what used to be the Daily Tiger, and now maybe it's the Daily Donkey. These six young uh, critics wrote about the film EO, and we've been making, like, I should have brought one. I'm so bad at PR. But anyway, so we made a little magazine, mini magazine together, and the young critics also made a video essay uh, with Nafis Nia's film Die Middag, that afternoon, that they're going to be presenting on Sunday, I think, and then there's going to be a talk show with them. So basically, it's a lot of critical activities related to I of R. Aside from that, I've been so happy that cinemas were open again. And yes. It's just <laughs> writing about films that got a release and that actually that I could communicate with an audience. And I'm working on some kind of a secret plan related to film criticism. So Ooh. maybe next year or okay, maybe before maybe next that. Year you can we reveal can, it. We can reveal it. Oh, I hope so. Maybe we can have the exclusive. So that, okay, good. that's the deal. <laughs> if, we, if we sort of succeed in pulling that off, then right. we'll talk about it more. Deal. Um, now, you co-curated the films in the Critics' Choice section here at IFFR. Can you tell us briefly a little bit about that? Bit yeah. More? So yeah. Critics' Choice, I think it's the ninth edition because we've just kept counting even during the pandemic and kind of these halfway versions that we did was brought back in the festival nine years ago as a context program, but also as a way to introduce this new form of the video essay into the festival context and give people an opportunity to make a video essay as another form of journalism. And especially now, because video essays are mostly made in the academic world, and I think it's such a great tool for critics to use the, the materiality of the film and communicate in with the toys and the tools of the, of the filmmakers. So what we do is once the selection or a little bit before is finished, we speak with people from IFFR, select some films, and then invite uh, critics to make a video essays. We have returning guests such as Kevin B. Lee, who will be opening this afternoon for EO. There's Inge Koolschaat, who did a video essay a few years ago and now is doing one for Aftersun. Joost Broeren, the Dutch critic, is doing one for Die Middag. So it's a wide variety of films. They all, in one way or another, deal with the theme of play. And play, we took very broad, um, could be role play, could be performativity, and it could also be speaking about the roles we as critics play. I mean, yeah. here in a podcast that's also being live recorded, writing, watching, thinking, those are all the roles that we have. Play, I love that theme, that's fantastic. And you mentioned After Sun. Let's have a look at a trailer for After Sun, then we can talk a bit more about it. I love you. Love you.
Why don't you go over and introduce yourself? Dad, no, they're like kids. Why don't you go over and introduce yourself? Mm. Sophie, they're like old. I think you live in my back Scotland. No. Why? There's this feeling once you leave where you're from that you don't totally belong there again. You okay through there? Don't you ever feel like tired and down and feels like your bones don't work, like you're sinking? Hmm. We're here to have a good time, eh? You know, I want you to know that you can talk to me about anything as you get older, you know? Done it all and you can too. I wish we could have stayed for longer. Me too. After somewhat beautiful film, tell me what you love about this film, then. Everything? Everything. <laughs> I don't no, know. I mean, I'm watching the clip again, and it's there's so much in there, and at the same time, it's kind of this ephemeral, almost untouchable cinematic experience. So I guess you must feel the same, I do, right? I do. I saw it um, for Cannes, so quite some months ago, but it just stayed with me. It, it, it is one of those films that is so specific in detail, but yet incredibly relatable. And I think that's one of its geniuses, actually. But it's about a father and daughter that go on holiday. And it's sort of about the childhood memories of, of the director, kind of semi-autobiographical, I believe. But it just takes you right into that holiday with them. And it doesn't let you go. It's like you're there, aren't you? But yeah, you're there and you're also, I mean, especially as a person who also is a daughter, who also was a child, it's kind of easy to go in that mindset and to understand how the cinematography is making you understand that memories are more about light or about a flickering or a glittering or a reflection and maybe not so much about an event. Yes, um, yes. And very much about a feeling. And I think that is... I mean, this is also what's been called female gaze, right? That you're more into this subjective perspective. So that's really beautiful. But for me, the film is also so much about how time loops. Because there's, I mean, we can't really speak about the film because we're going to be spoiling heavenly. And it's, I mean, this is just a film that you just want to be with because the film invites you in. But it's also dealing with time and how experiences maybe not chronological and how memory works and I always love it when films do that yes the subjectivity of time yeah. in a way yeah absolutely Charlotte Wells the director is fantastic at that I could talk all day about yeah some, I know <laughs> I already started to kind of give a lecture but it's, it's no really I love it to so heart. to see it if you haven't seen so. it is what we're saying um you know and it's available on movie in the UK so you can watch it there but you've also chosen that afternoon and before we bring on a very special person connected with that film let's have a look at the trailer سیم دیگه بر نمیگرده تو از کجا میدونی؟ لا گورد بیاسی ایست خلیرد فکر کنم تو دینس؟ دیلیرد آفز خیلید نیم فوره که کن خروته تو اولی نفر نیستی این جای دیگه نداری بری گیر افتادی تو سر نوشته جام تو اون روزی که زندگی عنوان یک خارجی باید بدوی هر چی بالات قوی تر اوج پرواز بیشتر آزادی آزادی یک توهم من تو 
فرقی با هم نداره این حق توی که در با نکن اما اینم حق منه که تسلیم نشم Please welcome the director of that afternoon, Nafis Nia. Welcome, Nafis. It's so lovely to have you on Girls on Film. Thank you very much for inviting um, me. Dana, please join in the conversation. We're going to have a chat, but if you've got questions as well, please chip in. Um, so congratulations on the film. As we saw from the trailer there, I mean, it's just, even if you haven't seen the film, I'm sure you can see from that, it's such a powerful film loaded with atmosphere um, and insight into other people's lives. I felt like I learned something about the characters. Can you tell me how it came about and why you decided to make it? This is actually a very personal story divided to uh, two characters. This is my story. That's the seed of the story. But when I talk to the people about my story, everybody, especially people uh, with uh, migration background, everybody said, oh, but this is my story. And I realized... It isn't my story anymore. It is everybody's story. Everybody who has uh, left home, uh, whether it's from a, a country for another or a city to another or for a neighborhood to another neighborhood, it's the story where everybody who left home to seek happiness. Were there any particular decisions you made in making this film where you were very clear that you wanted to do things differently in a way that perhaps we haven't seen films treating this subject before? Yeah, for example, I'm not afraid of experimenting and uh, I, I am a huge fan of Yasujiro Uzo, Japanese uh, filmmaker, and I always wanted to just put uh, the, the, the camera and leave the characters to just move around and catch them as he did. And... Uh, I don't know if you are realized, oh no, you, don't, you didn't see the film, but... Um, <laughs> just a trailer. Just, just a trailer, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, for example, we had to make a decision for style and uh, I wanted to uh, avoid, for example, uh, being always grey and dark and, and that kind of atm atmosphere around uh, refugees, because... Their dreams are also colorful and they put always color and makeup. So especially uh, people from Iran, they are always very particular about their makeup and, you know, how they wear and everything. And I wanted to just take the color with me. Also, that's one of the things I try to uh, We saw put. a bit of that in the trailer, right? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah the exactly. the walls are painted. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I love that about, you know, your, your female character. She could fit into any number of different genres. It's not like it's a specific kind of film. She's, she's very complex and perhaps flawed. Would you want to talk, to, you know, from more from a female perspective, a little bit more about what you were proud to bring to the screen in terms of that complexity? Because we're always celebrating that on Girls on yes. Film. Yeah. I am so proud of her because this is her uh, first film actually role we had uh, many many uh, auditions and I couldn't just you know find my character and suddenly I just began to just look for her on Instagram and uh, looking uh, Iranian actress model so I uh, came across of uh, her uh, account and I thought she is the one she is my Roya and um, what's her name for the audience uh, Hodoniku Hodaniko. She yeah. is Iranian actress uh, now living in South Korea, mm -hmm. arrived uh, um, right now. And immediately I knew that. And uh, some of my colleagues, they said, but, oh, she's too beautiful. But I said, yes, she is beautiful. But at the same time, there is an innocent kind of side of her. And I, uh, she can be Roya. And of course, maybe I can tell Roya means dream in Persian language. So Actually, all of my female uh, characters, the leading act characters, they are always called Roya. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, how, how powerful. That's lovely. Yeah. yeah. There is a the wonderful sense of hope and dreaming in this film, despite, as you say, difficult circumstances. Yeah. And so I'm really curious to know what everyone thinks of when they've seen it. I know the audience um, hasn't seen it yet, but Dan, have you got questions having seen it? Is there anything L else? Well, I think there's something that's so beautiful to talk about, and it's language, because Nafis is also a poet and for Dutch speaking people in the audience um, she wrote some articles for the correspondent which is an online journalist platform also about the experience of arriving in a country and kind of learning a new language and there's a beautiful scene in the film that deals with that and I'm this is so close to your heart I think talk a little bit about that 
this, the, the importance of language because it's also bilingual, the film, and the characters move from Farsi into Dutch and vice versa? Yes, I have immense, enormous uh, love for Dutch language. It is my second home and also second my, uh, I call it father tongue and uh, because my mother tongue is Persian. I knew I have to... Actually, without thinking about it, I knew I am going to use that struggle or also loving language and learning language in my film because it's also it was also the way I just, you know, uh, experienced it. And I could also use it to express her feelings and towards him and his feelings towards uh, her. Yes, of course, I'm a poet and I, you know, as a poet, you can't just, you know, put your poetic side. <laughs> you can't put it aside. So I, I used it. it. I'm so glad that you brought that scene up because I loved it as someone that's interested in language. And even though I didn't understand either of the languages that was being spoken, you know, even the subtitles and, and also what I could see on screen and that connection between your two actors yeah. is really tangible. It's interesting. And I don't want you to necessarily answer this, but with the team, we were having a debate about whether there is a romantic element in this film or not and uh, maybe we'll leave that ambiguous for those who you haven't seen I it I leave yet. it on yeah. an, an but it was audience. interesting that we had different views on that so I'd, I but love a film like that there's also different ways to interpret romance right true so Connection. maybe yeah. there is also something more existential going on exactly see yeah. this is a, this is what we were saying at <laughs> dinner last night yeah, yeah we'll, we'll discuss it more over drinks afterwards for when those of us have seen the film thank you so much for coming thank on you. thank you thank you so hope to you know see you around the festival and have a great time Definitely. congratulations thank, thank you again. thank you so much Anna. My next guest is another very, very special guest. She is an incredible producer. It is Christine Vachon. Please welcome her. Thank you. Come join me, Christine. Thank you. I know you've just pretty much got off a plane, so thank you so much. You've come from Sundance, and Past Lives, I hear, was an incredible success there. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, Past Lives is the first feature of a young South Korean playwright named Celine Song. Uh, we made it with A24. You know, it's a partly autobiographical story of immigration, loss, what happens when you leave one life behind and find another one. And it's really beautifully told, and it did really, really well there. So it was, it was great to be back at Sundance as well. Yeah, in-person festivals, it's, you can't exactly, beat it, can you? Exactly, yeah, wonderful. Now, you've been in this game a while, and you've done some incredible films. Very hard work, I'm sure. Is it fair to say you still love your job? Yes, I do. I mean, I think that we're all dealing with the various, the changes in the industry that, you know, cause us to pivot wildly, constantly. But I do still love it. I mean, when you take a movie, you know, just like Past Lives, taking that to Sundance and having that kind of connection with an audience, it's really just does remind you why you do it. And I think, you know, the, the years previous, you know, the past few years, we made a lot of movies, but not being able to have that one-on-one -on -one was hard. Yeah. Yeah, I think we feel the same about the live podcast. I'm sure. It's lovely to be in the room with you all today. And as you know, with Girls on Film, we're very interested in showing underrepresented groups on screen. It feels like a lot of your work has done this. Did you, did you start out with an ethos like that? 2020 hindsight is the best. I think when I started out, I knew there was a kind of movie that spoke to me that felt um, provocative and original but also entertaining. Like I really was not, you know, at that time in New York, you know, one million years ago, which is when I started out, <laughs> there were narrative, you know, there was Hollywood movies and there were experimental films and there really wasn't a whole lot in between. And the experimental films really weren't my cup of tea. I wanted something that was entertaining, but I wanted it to be about something that was more meaningful and maybe have characters and lives that I didn't see on screen. And do you feel that it has become different in terms of proposing those kind of films and financing those kind of films? Do you think the landscape has shifted? I mean, the landscape has shifted in so many ways. Yeah, yeah. It's not, I could talk for 20 minutes on the glass half full version, mm -hmm. and I could talk for 20 <laughs> minutes on the glass half empty version. So, you know, as you pointed out, you know, no women were nominated 
as directors at the Academy Awards this year. On the other hand, you know, I do, and I also do feel we really focus on female directors, which we absolutely should, but there's so many other ways for people to be creative in film where women are still woefully underrepresented, but they're just not as visible. So that's, you know, I think it's, it's great that more women are, are, are coming up and directing features and directing television, et cetera. But I really am waiting for the day when, you know, everybody behind the camera is, you know, has a shot. Yeah, that's why we've got a cinematographer category in our exactly. awards and such, like I totally agree. Before we have a clip of a film of yours I've really enjoyed, again, I'm sure you could go on for half an hour, but if there's any women in particular listening who wants to go into producing, what advice would you give them? Some days my advice would be like, what are you, out of your fucking mind? <laughs> uh, it's a tough job because we are, you know, underappreciated. A friend of mine said, and I'm not quite sure who to attribute this quote to, but it's attributable to somebody, and it's very good, which is producing is, you know, being asked to organize and throw the best party in the world, not being invited to it, and then being handed the bill at the end. <laughs> so I would say that's kind of true, you oh, know? wow. Okay, so it's good to go in with your eyes open, probably. And, and I, I mean, I do think it, in, in all seriousness... Producing requires a certain kind of fearlessness and a appetite for risk. And that's tough these days. I find when I speak to, you know, folks like you, often I get asked, like, well, what about, like, you know, work-life balance? And I'm like, there isn't any. Yeah. Let's have a clip from a film I particularly enjoyed that we covered on the podcast that you produced, and that is Zola. Bitch that won't dance for money be the same bitch that be out on the black. Same bitch that wanna smile in your face be the same bitch that gonna come for you later. Period. Oh God. Oh God. Like why you on my Twitter? Why you on my Facebook? Why you on my Tumblr? Why are you DMing me? Sis, why are you tagging me sis. in photos? You don't even fuck with me. Sis. Let me know. Sis. Let me know. Yes, me sis. Know. Great film, great film. I love it. I mean, basically, with the clip, I'd just love to say to you, is there anything you want to say about that film? Highlights, lowlights, why you're proud? I mean, that film, the, I'm enormously proud of that film. It was, it premiered at the last live Sundance. Not the one we just had, obviously. And then, of course, its release got completely mangled by the pandemic, which was just tragic. But it has absolutely found its audience and has, you know, become incredibly resonant. It's one of those films that I'm so confident in anyone I recommend it to that they will enjoy it. It is, you know, and actually you can't say that of many films. That's true. Yeah, and, and from our point of view in Girls on Film, fantastic in representation and two amazing female characters at the centre. Um, let's talk a bit about Far From Heaven, Todd Haynes' film, because I remember reviewing that back in the day and being just blown away by this film. What are your memories of that film? Well, a big memory is that uh, Julianne Moore was pregnant when right. we were shooting the film, and it was like a race to, like, <laughs> let's just, like, get this movie, you know, let's, like, let's get it done before, you know, this becomes, like, and, that, and she literally went away on a Friday, you know, went home on a Friday and showed up on the Monday, and it was like, oh, okay, that's happened. <laughs> um, <laughs> But really, I mean, in, in all seriousness, my, my memory of that film was really just, it felt like Todd was at the top of his craft, and, um, and, and he's only continued to be, of course, but it was really, I think, for him, a kind of coming together of, you know, a, a number of extraordinarily creative people, yeah. like Sandy Powell, for example, yeah. who were all getting to do some things for the first time. That's interesting, yeah. The, the amazing people at the top of their craft working together for the first time. That's something very exciting about that. I think that comes across just watching it and, yeah, to work with these people must have been amazing. Another one I remember reviewing back in 2005, The Notorious Betty Page, Mary Hannon's film. We've got a, a poster of that here. 
I mean, I actually haven't watched this since it came out, but in my memory, it feels like it was sort of quite groundbreaking to have a female director, you know, lots of women behind the scenes, presumably, and quite a sex-positive film. Would you want to speak about that a lot? Yeah, I mean, it's funny, the still you're showing is in colour, and the movie's in black and white. <laughs> That's true, actually, yeah. Um, which was another enormous risk, you know, that, in fact, when we were trying to get the film financed, HBO ended up financing it when they had a theatrical division. And they initially were like, oh, well, if it's in black and white, we're not going to do it. Right. And then they changed their minds. You know, look, I think Mary Heron's an extraordinary director. We did, I shot Andy Warhol with her, which was, you know, her first film and probably not far off. I mean, it wasn't my first film, but it was probably like number five. And do you know how many movies I've produced now? Over a hundred isn't that insane? I mean, wow. Like, and then I think I didn't really, and I look through why, and I'm like, no, I did. I, yeah, I did that. I did do that. Yeah, I did. So, you know, you know, number five feels like in you know the Paleolithic times or something. <laughs> when you look down that list, how do you feel? I feel. This is the crazy thing about film production. It's kind of unpleasant. Also, I think it's like giving birth. Like if you remembered how painful it was, you wouldn't do it again. <laughs> so every time I get to a film set, I'm a little like, oh God, I forgot. <laughs> I hate this. Why am I doing this again? <laughs> but then when the movie goes out into the world and, you know, look, threading that needle of a movie that is beloved by an audience and critics and awards worthy, et cetera, comes around once in a blue moon. You know, more often what happens is you give it your all, you're proud of the movie, and it finds some audience, maybe not as big an audience as you want, but the one good thing about the longevity and doing this for so long is that I've seen movies that we made a million years ago slowly work their way up because now, you know, they can and people can rediscover them and rediscover them and rediscover them. So that's very gratifying. I mean, when people, I get stopped on the street like twice a month, you know, or as my daughter says, that's not famous, you know. <laughs> uh, um, and somebody says to me, when I get stopped on the street, the person stopping me says, you produced my favorite movie. Oh. And it's never the same movie. And that's pretty great. Like, if you can keep producing movies that people say is their favorite, then I'll take that. That's amazing. And before we come to the audience, because um, we might have some people there who might say that you produce their favorite movie, um, I want to ask about what you've got coming up, because it's a great film on Berlin, right? Yes, yeah, so we have the opening night movie in Berlin. It's a film by Rebecca Miller called She Came to Me. And it's with Anne Hathaway, Peter Dinklage, Joanna Kulig, I, oh, oh, and Marissa Tomai. And I always leave out one actor, and, and I am so jet-lagged. I'm sure <laughs> that I've left out somebody really important. We'll put the full list in the show uh, notes so people so, can see, so you're covered. And then Past Lives, uh, Celine Song's film, is also going to be in competition in Berlin. So we're going to have a doubleheader there. Wonderful. Well, I think, was that a question over there? Is there a hand up over there? Hi, my name is Nuheida, and I was wondering, what is uh, one of the biggest issues you got during, um, you know, uh, filming uh, Zola, and how do you resolve the issue? What was our biggest issue? Production-wise, yeah. Production-wise, filming Zola? You know, it was a relatively low budget. I don't really, I mean, it was, it was the typical... We didn't have, you know, we wanted more days to shoot. We wanted, you know, more resources, et cetera. But that's pretty typical for an independent film. So I don't feel like Zola faced challenges that were specifically unique to it, you know. I remember it really as being, you know, pretty, you know, well-organized and, and Janixa was terrific. It was a good shoot. Great. Thank you for your question. Anyone else? Hi there. My name's Hedda. And... Um, I'm just stunned by the number of films that you've produced. And I wonder if you could say something about how you decide which projects to go with. It's a good question. I mean, I guess it's a sort of 
combination of, of the things I said before. Is it, is it original? Is it provocative? Is it entertaining? But I think the other element, which is, the hard, is a hard thing to really describe, is, is it makeable? You know, I mean, in the States, we don't have the subsidies that, that folks in Europe have. And so I've got to walk that thin line between, like, art house and commercial and, and justifying a budget. And so sometimes I read something and I'm just, and I have a great partner, Pam Koffler, and sometimes we literally sit there for hours and are like, is, talk about, is there a path? Is there a path to get this made? And sometimes we see, sometimes it's just about like, we have to get like an amazing movie star. Sometimes it's like, this is a really zeitgeisty story. And sometimes we just don't see it. So it's a mix of the pragmatic and the artistic, which I think sort of defines our company. Great question, thank you. And the question over here, please. Hi, I'm Cassie Joy from SA People. Uh, would you be able to elaborate on the current and imminent pivots that have to be made to make it in the film industry today? Um, I think the biggest pivot is what are we actually calling the film industry? Like if a movie is financed by a streamer and goes directly to that streamer, is it still a movie? You know, I mean, those are the, you know, when I started out, the big question was what makes something theatrical? because that's kind of, that's where we lived. And we talked about that a lot, universal themes and big ideas and, and the desire to see something collectively, et cetera. The big pivot I think right now, and I honestly don't know what this means, but I am starting to feel that perhaps there's a certain kind of uh, character-driven drama that a lot of, of audience has decided they will watch at home. And that's, that's a big deal. So look, I've seen a lot of change in the business since I started. I remember being at the Sundance Producers Conference when the Blair Witch Project came out. It came out that weekend. And, and that was the first like, you know, shot on, on video movie. And everybody at that, they were all like, I'm never, I'm always going to shoot on film. And it was like, well, ha, 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 <laughs> you know? Like those genies just come out of the bottle and they don't go back in. And that's how, you know, you kind of have to, as somebody who wants to, you know, stay relevant and keep making films, I'm always looking to see, like, how do we, how do we use disruption for opportunity, mm. you know? And that's, you know, I think that's why we've stayed in business so long. So there's a million pivots. I think that, you know, right now it is what makes something theatrical? What makes something better suited for a streamer? Mm -hmm. What makes something, you know, better suited for whatever we're calling television these days? <laughs> I mean, you know, I said to my daughter the other day, like, I was like, when's it on? And she was like, Huh? <laughs> when I want it to be on. What are you talking about? So, you know, all of those things. That's a great question to Thank end you. on. Thank you so much. Um, Christina, it's been such a pleasure to talk to Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining Girls on Film. Round of applause, Christina Sean. Thank you. So my next guests have made a terrific film called Superposition, which is in the film festival today. We're going to have a look at a trailer in a minute. But first, I would like to welcome on the director, Carolina Lingva, and star Mary Bach Hansen. Please join me. Hi, Hi Marie. Hey. Hi, Carolina. Hi. Welcome Hi. to Girls on Film. Thank you. Thank you. It's lovely to have you both here. Thank, Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Well, I, I thought Superstition was such a fascinating film. I don't know if anyone else here will have seen it yet. So let's have a look at the trailer. Vi sidder her i en svensk skov, fordi vi har trukket stikket. Projektet er så at se, om vi kan klare os uden om civilisationen. Om vi kan finde en ny måde at være sammen på som familie, som par. 
Vi er så seje. Hvem kender vi ellers, der to gør det her? Hvad håber du på, at vi finder herude? Jeg håber på at finde dig. Hinanden. Vi har virkelig trukket til ved vækkerne os selv, hvad gør det her? <laughs> and that is just the beginning. I mean, for, for, our, for our listeners listening in English, I'd like to ask, because this is so hard to discuss without spoilers, as you can see, it's a yeah. very high concept thriller. I really loved it in ways that I cannot discuss on stage with you. <laughs> right. um, but, but Carolina, can you tell, you know, when people say, what's your film about? How far do you go? Can you give us a little plot summary? And how far would you go in telling them what it's about? Well, it's a bit difficult because actually in this festival, there's been told a little more than we usually <laughs> ah. tell. But to describe the plot, it's a family of three uh, leaving the urban life, going to uh, going off the grid into the Swedish forests to like find find themselves, find each other, to find peace of mind. And uh, when they discover that they're not as alone as they thought they were, it sort of spoils their feeling of being unique. And that it sort of spirals into something not so great on quite a few levels. That's beautifully put. I love that description. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I really loved all the twists and turns and seeing where it was going and trying to guess where it was going. Marie, what did you think um, when you... By the way, congratulations on fantastic performance. Thank you so much. Um, what did you think when you got the script? I really loved the script from the beginning. We worked a lot on it uh, too, like the dialogues and with uh, Mikkel, the, the male character, and Caroline and I, we were like going into the conversations that a couple has and like all these uh, character details and but um, I really really loved the plot and the story and actually what you just said about it it was intriguing to me the because I know that feeling that I want to feel unique yes. in my choices that yes. I make in life and uh, it can be a bit like oh, now the others are doing it too, then I'm going to do something else. And like the thing about being a unique individual and not, and I think it's a lot, it's something we have in our time, right? That we should be unique and um, not in a community. And it's like, we shouldn't be like everyone else. So that really, that theme really intrigued me. Yeah. How long was the shoot? Six weeks. Six weeks, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And was it all on the beautiful location that we see there? Or was there trickery? Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. that's absolutely stunning. Yeah. 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 We basically lived in Sweden for six weeks, yeah. more or less. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's beautiful. Anyone I know that's seen it says, I want to go and stay in that house. It's exactly. just absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. <laughs> Still? Really? Well, yeah, maybe not now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit creepy. <laughs> But I think from a gender perspective, this film is really interesting, which is one of the reasons we wanted to talk to you. There's a lot about relationships. There's a lot about the gender dynamic between um, a couple. And what kind of conversations did you two have as well about, about gender and about the dynamic between the male and the female in that relationship? And I, again, I know this is a challenge without spoilers. I have to be very honest, because maybe that's going to be very interesting too. But as far as I remember, correct me if I'm wrong, None. None. Interesting. <laughs> That's very interesting. Actually, really? Yeah. So we might, maybe yeah. we can open that together because yeah. uh, it never occurred to me that it would be a gender, I mean, uh, it, maybe you can say yeah, something else, but I'm, because yeah. I'm just from the inside of yeah. like being in a couple and male and female and yeah. uh, I mean, just, it was something else. It was more about the, the persons and the characters yes. and how they move in. So maybe you can elaborate a bit on that. Well, it was something that, I mean, when we were writing, uh, my co-writer and I, we were thinking, I mean, the way it actually came up was that because it's a it, uh, female character, was the lead character in the film, and it's um, it turned out, uh, surprisingly for us, that, that once, because she's not only a sympathetic character, mm -hmm. none of them are, that, uh, and I always loved that, uh, to have like th th that sort of ambiguous traits of character, and 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 you see too few lead uh, female characters who can and you who can do that. And when you actually, and when you try to get funding, it's also quite hard because a lot. Of, I, what you know, a lot of people would like to see something more simple in a yeah. way, and they're very afraid that you know that's not uh, people are going to sympathize with that. That's going to be you know. It was clear to us that. There were like it was a more narrow path with a female character than with a male character, especially when you deal with someone who's a mother, because you can't do a lot of things without you thinking that she's a bad mother, 
And I don't think that's the, exactly the same if you trade places and it was a man. So that was uh, interesting uh, on a writing uh, the perspective, yeah. That is very interesting, and that, that's very relevant to a lot of what we discuss in the podcast. It's so interesting, particularly what you say about the mother thing, that once someone is characterized as a mother, yeah. Yeah, and can I just say that that uh, for me as an actress, it is so, I value so much when when people like you, Caroline, make films with female characters like this, and it's such a pleasure to play, because why not? Why shouldn't women be able to like be unlikable or make weird yeah. choices and... <laughs> Yeah. So so um, yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's what we we you know been pushing for, and it, and it's I'm sorry to hear that that's still a conversation that needs to be had, right? To get financing, you know. Yeah. Well, it wasn't exactly to get financing, but it was just a concern mm -hmm. um, around a lot of people that we were present, and it was also just among the two of us. It's a I have a male co-writer, but it was just something that we discovered. Both of us were like, wow, if you trade the gender of this uh, this character and and what this person does. It reads completely different also for, from our perspective. Yeah. And that's just uh, amazing that's still the case, and especially with, with motherhood and, and, yeah. I like that you feature a podcast in this film as well. <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily that flatteringly. No, I know. <laughs> <laughs> if you see it, you know what I mean, but that, I enjoyed that. Um, I'd like to ask you, actually, Caroline, what your favourite films are um, in the, let's say, genre films. Is there Not necessarily influences, but ones that you've enjoyed watching. Well, I'm, like, from... Way back, I'm a really big David Lynch fan. <laughs> I'm not trying to imitate that, but like in in the newer films, I uh, I very much enjoyed films like The Lighthouse. I thought that was a really original, fabulous film. I um, I always like those genre mixes, like was spoken about before. Also, this um, I'm very drawn to like films who who combine genre and also have like in depth character work and 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 you know it's sort of on the verge of art house. Also, art house and commercial, and can be entertaining in the in, in the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you've absolutely done that with this film, Marie. How did this um, film differ from other films you've made in other genres? I haven't done a, done a lot of film actually. I don't have a lot to compare pair with. But uh, for me, the the very sig significant thing about this shoot was that we were so few people that it was just me and Mikkel and the boy and Caroline and Amelia, the producer, sitting here. Um, and a, a very small team uh, of very nice and very good people. So that was really... Uh, I really liked the um, intense feeling that we had, that we were really into the stuff all the time and yeah. discussing scenes in the night and uh, meeting the next day and staying... Me and Mikkel lived in the same house in two for two weeks. And I really liked this dedication you feel to towards the project when you stay at the same place and stay where the characters stay almost. Yeah, so that's like the most significant uh, thing about the shoot yeah, that I really loved. The intimacy really comes across yeah. when you watch it. I think you feel all, all claustrophobia even. That sense, yeah, exactly. Sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, being being sort of trapped in a way, yeah. away from everyone else. Yeah. Um, you talked a little bit about, you know, unlikable female characters and yay, but um, would either of you like to speak about um, the film industry from a gender perspective in Denmark in particular at the moment? Well, it's been like a huge conversation for a long time uh, because it, it wasn't really happening that more... They were, we were trying to make it happen, but it wasn't really happening. But I think it, within the few uh, five years or something, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not, I, I don't exactly know, but within the last few years, I think it's actually really starting to pick up with more female directors getting funding and, and also just, yeah, screenwriters, cinematographers even. Is. So Glad that's, that. that's a progress right now going on. Yeah, and I just want to add that actually the the last three projects I think I did was in with was like very female driven and with like st also TV series and with a strong uh, I, th I feel like more f female directors and writers and are coming coming forth with their stories and yes. like these uh, collectives of female um, like artists I, I, uh, I hope looming, so. Yeah, yeah that, that's that's amazing. And it, that's the impression we get. And I, and I hope it's lovely that every time people come on a podcast like this, they say, things are moving on, hopefully, yeah. slowly. What are you up to next? I mean, you mentioned that you've got three things. Uh, what can we see coming up? Next Sunday, uh, I'm premiering with a TV series about the dancers at a cabaret in the 70s in Denmark, the very, very famous cabaret thing. Um, so it really is about the whole 
sexism things and f women being just a prop that you have uh -huh. like on stage. And so it's a TV series that gives these women a voice, dancers, the invisible dancers. Uh, but it's uh, in Danish television, so I'm not sure. Maybe it's gonna be. Come I want out. to watch it. I hope yeah, I can watch I it. Think I'm it's sold. Gonna be, <laughs> I think it's gonna be. Less. And then I'm gonna do some theatre. And yeah, so. we have listeners in Denmark, so hopefully. They okay, will be great, answer. great. <laughs> and yourself, what are you working on next? Yeah, I'm doing a TV series now, um, uh, directing a TV series, and I have also um, a new fe feature film, uh, just in the writing. Well, wow. yeah. I hope you come back on Girls on Film and tell us about it. Yeah. Meantime, I'd love to ask the audience, actually, if they've got um, any questions for you or any comments they want to make about anything that we've discussed today, just briefly. Hi. Um, how seamless is it transitioning from feature to TV shows to theatre in both of your careers? Uh, for me, uh, I really enjoy it. I really like... I've, I've had a career where I could do that, like knock on wood that it's gonna <laughs> continue you never know but uh, I like the switch be between for example I mean TV and film is a bit similar but I like the switch between film and TV and uh, to theater and back again because for me as an actor I really need to like get the feeling of being in touch with my audience and being there in the now and then because uh, it's that's the main thing that is very different from when you give a performance and then you leave it for one year and see it on screen and you haven't had anything to do with it. So that's the main difference. But I really, really like to like do both. And I hope that I can continue because I learn a lot from theatre and I learn a lot from film and TV. Yeah, and I, yeah, I haven't done uh, theatre, but this uh, to me is also, I mean, very nice. To, this is the first time I'm doing TV, TV series like this, like a bigger uh, thing. This has taken, obviously, it takes a long time to do a feature film. I, I came up with the idea. I wrote it. I've been, like, on board with this film for so long. So it's like your heart. It's your baby. And you love it. But it's actually really nice to also interpret what somebody else has uh, been writing on this TV series and just um, and work with some something else. Any other questions? I was wondering, as you were touching up on the subject of uniqueness, and we are talking about womenhood and women in film, if you feel like there, what is that unique thing that women bring or can bring to film? That's a really difficult question. Do you have anything? I <laughs> think I can say something, but for me, it's not really women or men, I think. For me, it's a way of leading and going into a process that is like, I feel like there's an old system and a newer system that we are discovering and maybe creating also now. Yeah, I think you would call it a female way of leading a bit that, that you can still be very firm and know what you want, but you can also be listening and soft at the same time. So these two things are not opposites. And I meet more and more of that. And I think men can also lead like that. And I think it's more of a, an, a, a new system that I'm so happy to have been in some projects. Also this with, with uh, Caroline, you're a great leader and Amelia is a great leader and um, are leading like this, that you listen still and you, you don't have to know the answer. And so I'm just so happy that I'm, I'm in projects that is developing this because I think it's a new language that we in not only in this business but in every, all businesses should look into and yeah develop together mm. so yeah and I'll just add I think you know when thinking about your question I think um, the, the older system has like maybe a specific way of looking at like directors or, or people in leading roles that has to be like you said very very certain and and yeah, and, and I think maybe there's an opening for something else where you can actually still be questioning and still be have a bit of a different style. And that's, uh, I th I'm also seeing, it's not there yet, but I'm also seeing uh, a more openness and, and at least a reflection of what is it we, we think about when we think of, of, of someone who's capable. Is it only, can you only be capable if you're like very certain of yourself all the time or is it also like a value or something you should cherish to actually, yeah, question. And just to add that it doesn't have to be slower. 
in production <laughs> because you do yeah. this. No, but it's very because yeah. it's like money wise. You're like no, 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 you lose time and but it's not actually. I think you end up maybe even getting more time sometimes. But we haven't figured out the system completely. But it's not like you don't have to lose money by doing this. It's just uh, <laughs> that's such a great question. I really love both your answers because I think that taps into a lot of what I've observed is that women are part of a shift forward that includes men. You know, all genders um, in directing, which is just a different style and perhaps more kind of thoughtful and considerate yeah. and sort of community and collaborative. So that's such a great question to end on. Thank you so yeah. much. Well, thank you both so much for joining Girls on Film. Thank you to all my guests, to Dan and Fist, and to Christine, to Carolina and to Marie. Round of applause for them, please. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I would, I, it's been lovely to have you all here today. I would love to encourage you all to uh, listen to Girls on Film, download it. You can find it everywhere, Spotify, Apple, you name it. Tell your friends, find us on social media. Say hello if you see us around at this wonderful festival. Massive thanks to IFFR for having us. But thank you all so much for joining Girls on Film. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this special episode of Girls on Film, which was recorded in front of a live audience at the International Film Festival Rotterdam. The festival runs until the 5th of February 2023 in Rotterdam, Netherlands. All details of the fest and the programme can be found at iffr.com. I'm Anna Smith and I was joined by my wonderful guests, Christine Vachon, Dana Linson, Nafis Nia, Caroline Lingebe and Marie Bach Hansen. Girls on Film is an HLA production brought to you by executive producer Hedda Archbold, producer Lydia Scott, audio editor Emma Butt and intern Eleanor Hardy. This episode was made in partnership with the International Film Festival Rotterdam. Thank you for listening. We'll be back soon. are never what we appear and every girl has her secrets. I'll say. <laughs>